so uh, welcome to the 20th century, everybody. Uh, we've spent so long in the 19th now, it feels kind of weird to be getting this far, like at, at the end of the semester. So we're only going to spend a little time uh, in this period. But, uh, so next time we're going to be looking at uh, <clears throat> World War I poetry. Um, so I think these are all the poems that I wanted you to read, plus a couple that I know Rylan wants to cover uh, when he does his presentation. So just make sure you have all of that covered. Um, does anyone have any questions about anything before we go over the vocab for the next week? Tell me what the Irish literary revival was. It was an attempt to kind of bring back through like some of the cultural nationalist agenda in Ireland, and mm -hmm. a lot of times they would set the stories in, um, or the poems, in kind of different Irish towns or cities. Uh -huh. They favored kind of a rural landscape, celebrated the peasant sort of culture, and then a lot of times included lots of bits and pieces about um, different Irish folklore and myths and mm -hmm. all those sorts of things. Let's Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you see, um, particularly in the early revival text, you'll see lots of references to fairies and to you know Irish gods and heroes and things like that. Yeah, and so yeah, it's it's yeah, part of an, it's an early attempt to create a specifically Irish literature in English, right? So kind of carving out space for Irish literature in English. So yes, good. All all of what you said was correct. All right. Explain to me the significance of the lock of golden hair. It was what Laura gave the goblin man because she didn't have any coin, and it was like a resemblance of her giving her the beauty. Uh -huh. Yep, that's the, 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 the currency on the marriage market, right? Mm -hmm. And the text? Um, the Goblin Market? <laughs> yes, Goblin Market, Christina Rossetti, right? Yes. Good, okay. Lizzie? against them, tell, like warning mm -hmm. her about them, and then yes. she ended up going to basically save her sister because mm -hmm. she was sick and hungry for their fruits. <laughs> yes. So what common uh, Victorian literary archetype does Lizzie represent? The angel of the house. Yes, and how does she revise the angel in the house archetype? She actually cares about the fallen woman and tries to save her. Yes, instead of shunning. Yes, mm -hmm. good. Reintegration rather than shunning. Good. All right. Anglo Irish. What does it mean to be Anglo Irish? It's an Irish person of English descent, and yes. usually they made up the two, like they kind of made up the higher and land owning classes, the professional classes in mm -hmm. Ireland, and yes. um, they were typically Protestant. Yes. So. Good. And what uh, writer that we've read belonged to this class? Yes, W.B. Yeats was Anglo-Irish. Good. All right, the silver penny. The silver penny is what Lizzie used to go mm -hmm. buy the fruit from the goblins to help save her sister Laura. Mm -hmm. um, when she gets there, she obviously tries to make an even exchange from yeah. with the fruit, and the penny, <laughs> but then they wanted to eat the fruit right there from her. So they attack her, and try to put it down her throat. But yeah. before this, she asked for her money back. Yeah, yes. Money back. Yes. So yeah, they they exclude her from commercial dealings, right? Yes. All right. Good. Cultural nationalism. It was like an attempt to make your culture like a distinct. Thing and like its own um, 
like an, its own sort of a nationality, like within a group of people, and they would set the parameters for kind of like uh -huh. what would be normal or socially acceptable or all these sorts of things. And right. a lot of times it was if they felt like their culture had been diminished by some sort of an imperial power, they would come uh -huh. back and like, no, we are our own thing, <laughs> and like all upset. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's, 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 it's so so like yes, yeah, so essentially yeah, it is an attempt to determine kind of the boundaries of who belongs to a specific nation, right? Through culture, whether it's through language organizations or through sports or through arts, right? That sort of thing. But yeah, it, it, it's kind of an attempt to express that kind of national spirit through uh, cultural um, activity. All right, good. And what text would we associate that with? Where have we met with cultural nationalists? Uh, Yeats. <laughs> yes, Yeats is a cultural nationalist, yes. Um, and we're going to see in the Joy story as well some uh, strong references to and opinions about various forms of cultural nationalism. All right, we've had Lizzie, now Laura. Tell me about Laura. Laura's the fallen woman. <laughs> so she actually is like uh -huh. stays back and is like curious about the goblins and she mm -hmm. ends up falling under their trap of eating the fruits and yep. she goes in her golden hair. Yeah. You know, she gets sick and all that. <laughs> yes, and must be revived through the efforts of her sister. Alright, and the Colonel Stone. That goes back to Laura, <laughs> and then she like tries to plant the fruits, but can't because you can't plant the exotic fruits because it's like specific to the goblin, and it represents like the otherness. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's a kind of yeah, sense of alienness mm -hmm. to the uh, you know, the fruits and to the kernel stone. It's also I think it's also another reference to infertility, right? Mm -hmm. That the her, her little uh, kind of like one night stand with the goblins kind of results in nothing. All right, the Celts. What's a Celt? Um, it was like kind of someone who was probably of like Irish or maybe even Scottish descent mm -hmm. and yep. the author like who wrote the thing um, about the Celts <laughs> was basically saying that they were a people that had like a high sensibility like almost mm -hmm. feminine and then also uh -huh. um, talked about like how they liked to learn but they felt like they didn't employ those talents or gifts to any practical end. Yeah, so it seems like kind of like part of an like kind of like Orientalist discourse, right? But applied to other Europeans uh, rather than um, to you know people from Asia. Uh, and yeah, um, and this is yeah Matthew Arnold's description of a Celt. And the, the Celt is set up in opposition to the practical Saxon, right? And so a lot of Irish cultural nationalist activity in the late 19th and early 20th centuries is an attempt to counter this image of the Celts that Arnold presents in his, uh, his essay on the study of Celtic literature. And finally, the United Irishmen Rising. Because they weren't successful, because yep. most of them were either arrested or executed. Yes, it is the first of a long string of unsuccessful Irish rebellions. Right. Yep. I mean, they were bold enough, but still no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for those men. And that was 1798. Uh, yes, 1798. Yeah, if it's one of the last major actions in which there's serious Protestant and Catholic cross community mm -hmm. cooperation. After that, most revolutionary activity is undertaken um, by uh, Catholic Native Irish populations. All right, good. So with that out of the way, 
Let's dig into the joints. So, uh, what y'all think of this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so at first, when I, when I first started reading it, I thought uh -huh. Lily would be main character, but then it kind of shifted, and Kaylee became yeah. main character. Mm -hmm. So that was, and it's kind of confusing at first. Yeah, we, we get Lily's perspective for a little over a page. Right. And then it shifts once Gabriel enters to Gabriel, right? Mm -hmm. So I think one thing we might want to think about as we're discussing is, gonna, is why that is, right? Why we do, if Gabriel's our perspective character, right? Why do we get someone else's perspective before he enters the room? What else did you guys pick up on here? Or anything, anything in particular that interested you or confused you? Um, I noticed there's a lot of references to death. Like even Lily's name uh -huh. is like a flower that's typically in like you know represented for like memorials and all that. So yeah, but it, it's, yeah, that, that's I actually not, I, I never thought of that. Yeah, that Lily is a funeral flower. Yeah, and she's described as a, a pale girl too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that there, there's there's something kind of ghostly about Lily from the very beginning. And yeah, so let's try to trace some of these references to Yes, Yeah, so we have Lily, who is pale. Where else do we see references to death or to the dead? Um, the snow at the end, he's like talking okay. about, I mean, that's kind of way further back, but like, <laughs> yeah. that's like, he says it's like a falling connection from the living world to the I guess, like yeah, it's falling on that churchyard in Uttarard in the west of Ireland where Michael Fury lies buried, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, the, yeah, the snow on the churchyard. And there are a lot of like little kind of, even just like kind of minor verbal references to death. Right? You know, like um, on you know the second page of the story where Gabriel says that Greta takes three mortal hours to dress herself, right? And yeah, there's a lot of just these kind of little offhand references to death, right? There's the story about the monks who sleep in their coffins. Uh, they don't, actually. I mean, they've got this detail wrong. <laughs> this particular order of monks do not sleep in coffins. Um, you know, they, they talk about these dead opera singers from years past, right? There are all these pictures of dead relatives all over the place. You know, there's the picture of Gabriel's mother, for example, who has passed on. Um, there's a lot of mention of dead relatives, also. Like, yeah. Um, is it Mary Jane's dad that's dead? Yeah, Mary Jane's father is dead. Um, um, there's yeah, but the story about uh, the grandfather and, and his horse. Aunt Julia is, seems to be dying because she's the great face sister. Yeah, yeah, at a certain point, Gabriel imagines be uh, attending her funeral, right? Yeah. So yeah, there, there, yeah, there, there's a lot of death and funereal imagery floating around here, especially for a story about a Christmas party, right? <laughs> <laughs> Anything else you guys picked up on? Well, there was Michael Furry's death that they were talking Fury, about. Fury, not Fury. Fury. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very, very important difference. And I think that this is another, like, like with Lily, I think the name there is potentially symbolic as well, right? Michael Fury. Oh, and in the song, like, mm -hmm. the footnote said that it was about a baby that, or the, the lyric said something about a baby that had died or something. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 so the basic plot of the ballad, The Lass of Ahrim, is a, it's a, sung by a young woman who is seduced and abandoned by the local lord. And, you know, she's standing in the cold and wet outside of his manor uh, with their dead baby in her arms, you know, singing you know, to be let in. And this song is also connected again to Michael Fury. It was the song he used to sing when he and Greta were young together in Galway, right? So what do you make of this guy, Gabriel Conroy, our protagonist here? What's Gabriel like? I don't 
don't know if this is correct, but I kind of got vibes of like he was arrogant, like kind of, I don't know, full of himself, I guess. Okay, what, what suggested to you that Gabriel is full of himself? I don't really know detail wise. Like, <laughs> I'm trying to think of it. Um, I don't know when he's like when in his speech, particularly uh -huh. when he's talking about like his aunts and how they're all um, what's the word for it? Generous, I guess. Uh huh. Like their generosity, like. Yeah, but at the same time, he's thinking of them as ignorant old women, yeah. right? <laughs> And yeah, and one of his worries about his speech and how it'll go over mm -hmm. is that he knows his, his level of education differs from the rest of the group, right? Um, you know, he, um, you know, uh, mentions, you know, he you know, got a couple of points to himself that he thinks the other's vulgar, right? So yeah, so then there seems to be, uh, he seems to put some kind of distance between himself and the other guests of the party, right? Even though, you know, most of these people are you know, either his relations or people he's known all his life. And yeah, one, one uh, measure of distance there yeah, is, is education, right? And I think that like, is his attitude towards his education with the others necessarily one of arrogance? Why does he worry about his level of education compared to the others? Does he want to lord it over them, or is he afraid of something? He's afraid they won't understand like what he's talking about. Yeah, so I think that there is an arrogance there, but it's an arrogance that's connected to insecurity, right? I was kind of reading him as like the family celebrity in a way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. They're, like really excited for him to get there, and then uh -huh. he got there, you know. He carved the goose, he sat at the head of the table, even though know, it wasn't necessarily his house. Yeah. Um, yeah, it kind of seemed like mm -hmm. they almost like revered him in a way. Uh huh. So. There is actually something going on with uh, Gabriel carving the goose. And do we see him doing other things for his aunts? So he carves the goose, right? They also sent him to go deal with Freddie Malins, right? Um, and yeah, I mean, like you know, they they assign little tasks to him, and he runs and he does them, right? So I think some of this has to do with like Gabriel's kind of self-realization at the end of the story, but there's another thing going on here as well. So does this party actually take place on Christmas, December twenty-fifth? Are you able to gather that? It does not. This is more close to the New Year. Yeah, it's got to be after New Year's, right? Because right. that's when Fred, Freddie Malins took the pledge on New Year's Eve. Right. Which means, um, in terms of timing here, he's been sober for less than a week. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so the party actually takes place on January 6th. And this is significant for two reasons. The first, which has to do with what we've just been talking about, is that in Ireland, January 6th is celebrated as Noleg Maman, which in Irish translates to Women's Christmas. Remember, like this kind of comes out of the uh, kind of Victorian tradition of celebrating Christmas over 12 days, right? Rather than on a single day. So women's Christmas um, in Ireland um, usually involves a couple of things. Right? One, women host parties. But at these parties, the men take on household chores. So it's one of um, a couple of kind of post-Christmas 
um, role reversal kinds of uh, holidays, right? So you have December 26th is traditionally Boxing Day, uh, you know, in which the household serves the servants. And yeah, January 6th is traditionally Women's Christmas where men do all the housework. Um, and Goose is the traditional No, like the mom dish. Now, does anybody know what else January 6th is in terms of uh, Christmas related holidays? Is it maybe King's Day? Yes, it is also known as Epiphany or the Feast of the Three Kings. But yeah, the name Epiphany is more important for our purposes, right? Does anybody know what an Epiphany is, where the word comes from? I think it's like, when you have a light bulb, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you have like a realization. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's, yeah, when, when, yeah you, you, you have like, the truth of your situation is suddenly revealed to you, right? And in fact, Epiphany in Greek means revelation or a showing forth. And the term is originally used um, in the Greek drama. And it referred to the moment in a play in which a god appears to resolve whatever thorny problem uh, the characters in the play have gotten themselves into um, and cannot seem to get themselves out of. So something like what like in Latin is called the deus ex machina, right? You know, the uh, god from the machine. The Greek epiphany was a similar sort of thing. And then in Christian theology, the term is adopted to mean the revelation of Christ's divinity to the three to the three magi. So, you know, a literal, like a literal kind of divine showing forth the revelation, you know, the revelation of divinity to some audience. Now, the reason this is important is because Joyce actually takes and adapts this idea to the practice of writing fiction. So, pretty much all of Joyce's short stories are built around what he calls epiphanies. And an epiphany for Joyce is the moment, it's something closer to what Ryan just said. It's the moment in which people or things reveal their essence or their, or their true character. So what we can expect from this story if Gabriel Conroy is our perspective character is that at the climactic moment we will get some sort of revelation or Gabriel will have some sort of revelation about the truth of his character. And I think it might be a good idea to kind of trace the development of kind of the way we deal with Gabriel, the way Gabriel deals with other people through the course of the story. So we start as 
was noted at the beginning of class, not with Gabriel, but with Willie. Now, why do you think Joyce does this? Why do you think Joyce gives us Lily first? Rather than simply having Gabriel walk into the party and start interacting with people. give us a chance to do? It gives us an interaction from Gabriel that's not him speaking, I guess. Yeah, we see him through somebody else's eyes, mm -hmm. right? Before we get inside his head. So we see him from the outside before we see him from the inside. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I think that that kind of gets at the kind of journey that Gabriel has to take over the course of the next 30 pages, right, you know? He learns to see himself from the outside, right? The way he actually looks to other people, rather than the kind of life he's built up for himself in his head, right? And so that's kind of why I mentioned my close to the end when him and and in the room and he comes by the mirror and he's like surprised by his own reflection. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well what's, and I think this is important too, what does Gabriel think is gonna happen when they get back to that hotel room? <laughs> he thinks he's about to get lucky. Yeah, <laughs> epically lucky, right? Yes. He seems to have it in his head that their pulses are throbbing together, right. that they are more simpatico than they've been since their honeymoon, right? <laughs> and that they're gonna get back to Gresham's Hotel, which is a real hotel in Dublin, and it's still there, and it's very nice. Um, they get back, and he thinks that they're going to have the best sex of their lives, right? <laughs> and then what happens? <laughs> <laughs> she tells him she is in love with somebody. <laughs> yeah, or, or that she had been, right? Yeah. You know, that, yeah, that, um, you know, that, that Greta actually has a past existence right. that's independent of her life with Gabriel. And he seems at various points to resent this, right? He never wants to talk about where she came from. He doesn't want to go back to where she came from. But yeah, um, you know, he, he's here confronted with the fact that she loved somebody else before him. And that this Michael Fury, who actually, you know, arguably died for her, loved her in a way Gabriel's not capable of. And <clears throat> I think part of the epiphany here is making that realization, right? That, oh, hey, other people have an existence outside of their relationships with me. Right. <laughs> um, and yeah, that, you know, that he is not the uh, strong cosmopolitan man about town he believes himself to be. Or that he, you know, tries to project to other people. In fact, when, let's look at the first uh, description we get of his appearance on page 413. Can I get somebody to read the paragraph uh, that starts with, he was a stout, tallish young man? I can. Yeah, thank you, Kim. It says, he was a stout, tallish young man, the high color of his cheeks pushed upwards, even to his forehead, where it scattered itself in a few formless patches of pale red. And on his hairless face, there... <laughs> scintillated, yeah. Okay. Like, right. like glittered, yeah. Okay, scintillated restlessly. Uh, the polished lenses and the bright gilt rims of the glasses, which screened his delicate and restless eyes. 
His glossy black hair was parted in the middle and brushed in a long curve between, uh, beh behind his ears, where it curled slightly beneath the groove left by his hat. Okay, thank you. So let's think about like what this physical description emphasizes about Gabriel. What are the things we notice here? Are there key words that help us maybe understand a little bit about his character? Well, it repeats like restless or restlessly multiple times, okay. which I find just a little interesting. Uh -huh. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, especially given yeah, how, how nervous and insecure he seems, especially around women through most of the party, right? So yeah, it gives off a little bit of a sense of kind of like restless, nervous energy. What else is good? Is there maybe even something else that we might connect that restlessness to a little bit? the comment that Lily had just like <laughs> just said and like how she was so bitter and like yeah, all the, upset and he's the kind of like the that is now is only all pal palaver and what they can get out of you right so palaver is basically a more polite way of saying bullshit right so yeah she's basically so, so like it's, it seems like like Lily has had some sort of bad experience in the recent past with a man right and Gabriel says something unintentionally insensitive that sets her off. And he gives her a coin to try to make the, make the problem go away, right? <laughs> Here, Merry Christmas, I'm gonna go, right? But I, I think, like, like, if we look at the description of Gabriel's face specifically, what do we see? What are we told about his face? of hill red. And uh -huh. I mean, he's just been outside. They're cold. Yeah. <laughs> so he's um, flushed. Yeah. And it's hairless. Yeah. He's got a hairless face. Now, note it does not say that he's clean shaven, right? It notes his hairless face. And what does a hairless face indicate on a man? Maybe immature. Yeah, it's yeah, could, like boy, it's a boyish, right? Yeah. He's a stout, tallish young man with a hairless face. So yeah, he has a kind of boyish appearance. Yeah, like somebody who's not fully grown yet, mm -hmm. even though we're told he's he's about forty. Is there any other kind of feature, or something he wears here, maybe that might be? might be interesting or telling here. His hat. <laughs> it says that he has a groove in his hair from his hat. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah, there's the other hat has left a groove in his hair. It also talks about his glasses. Yeah, the glasses. Yeah, it, yeah, it draws particular attention here to his glasses, right? On his hairless face, they're scintillated restlessly. The polished lenses and the bright gilt rims of the glasses, which screened his delicate and restless eyes. So let's think about this for a minute, right? What does this mean about the way Gabriel looks at the world? Ruins. Yeah. There's always something between his eyes and what they're looking at, right? I think that word screened is particularly important here. He looks at everything, he observes everything from a slight remove, right? We don't see him participating much in what other people are doing. And what he does, it seems to be a failure for the most part. But yeah, the glasses mean that he's looking at everything through a slight remove, through a kind of like aesthetic distance. And <clears throat> it's probably worth pulling out here what I think Joyce is referencing in Gabriel's character here. 
So there's a movement in, it starts in France and then kind of uh, works its way into England by the end of the 19th century uh, called aestheticism. Anybody ever heard this term before? Maybe in an art history class? <laughs> no? I've heard of it, I don't know what it means. <laughs> I know it's like uh, aesthetic is like trying to understand yeah. to one's senses. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you know, when we talk about aesthetics, we're talking about like a particular theory of beauty, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah, so aestheticism specifically, um, is a late 19th century movement that is most associated with the phrase, right, art for art's sake. Right, that is kind of like an aestheticist believes that art is good in and of itself and should serve no purpose other than to be beautiful, to be admired, right? So, um, you know, one of the key statements of aestheticism is in um, the introduction to a novel by uh, the French writer Theophile Gautier. The novel's called Mademoiselle Maupin. Nobody reads the novel anymore, but the uh, introduction is important. Um, you know, there's a paragraph in which he talks about how, like, you know, the, you know, a work of art exists to be admired, right, and must not be useful. The most useful object in your home, according to Gautier, is your toilet. But you'd be nuts to admire it. We, have, we do have a talk like that in our history. It's like the, <laughs> well, one example yeah. would be like a McDonald's cup versus a pottery cup. Like, nobody's, like, the McDonald's plastic cup is just as useful. So like yeah. no one really cares about the art, it's more of just to be looked at. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, and, and th that's, yeah, that's aestheticism. What matters is beauty. And a beautiful object exists to be admired. Now, one of the high priests of this cult of aestheticism uh, was a guy by the name of Walter Pater. And Pater uh, was an Oxford professor um, who wrote a book in 1867 called Studies in the History of the Renaissance. And this book is most important for its uh, conclusion, in which Pater argues that like everything in the world is always in flux. And you can never get quite the same thrill from a sense impression the second time. So use the example of you know, a friend walking up to you and splashing you with a little bit of cold water on a hot summer day. Now, how does that feel when your friend first walks up and splashes you? Really good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you get a kind of like little, like kind of like tingly sensory thrill from it, right? Now, then, how does it feel if they splash you a second time, and a third time, and a fourth time? <laughs> More annoying, probably. But yeah, but, but like you, you don't get that same tingle, right, on subsequent splashes. And Pater argues that what life ought to be, or really the, like, what indicates success in life is the ability to kind of crystallize and keep with you your original sensations, right? On encountering a new thing, right? It says, you know, to burn always with this hard gem-like flame is success in life. Right, so to crystallize these moments in which you have these important sense impressions. And this is something that we see Gabriel doing pretty much all the time. Like when he's um, dancing with Miss Ivers on page 419. 
Can I get somebody to start reading the paragraph that starts with a look of perplexity appeared on Gabriel's face? What? Which page? Page 419. Okay, I'll read it. A look of perplexity appeared on Gabriel's face. It was true that he wrote a literary column every Wednesday in the Daily Express, which he would pay 15 shillings for that. That did not make him a whisper in Sherman. The books he received for review were almost more welcome than a paltry check. He loved to fill the covers and turn over the pages of newly printed books. Nearly every day when his teaching in college was ended, he used to wander down the quays to the second-hand booksellers to hit his own bachelor's walk to Webb's or Macy's on Aston's Quay, or to Old Clawhesses um, in the by street. Okay, we, not, we, we can stop there, right? right? What does Gabriel enjoy about reviewing books? Appearance that he likes. What does he like to do with new books? It says he likes to feel them. <laughs> yeah, he likes the feeling of the covers of new books, right? So yeah, like so. That, so like for him, a book is a sensory pleasure, right? And this, you know, he, he's kind of like having this little reverie over, um, you know, what what it feels like to pick up a new book. When he's thinking about his life with Greta, and um, you know, maybe you know, having you know some high hopes for what's going to happen when they get back to the hotel on page 434, right? He says, she was walking on before him so lightly and so erect that he longed to run after her noiselessly, catch her by the shoulders, and say something foolish and affectionate into her ear. She seemed to him so frail that he longed to defend her against something and then to be alone with her. Defend her against what? Doesn't matter. Something, anything, right? Moments of their secret life together burst like stars upon his memory. A heliotrope envelope was lying beside his breakfast cup, and he was caressing it with his hand. Birds were twittering in the ivy, and the sunny web of the curtain was shimmering along the floor. He could not eat for happiness. They were standing on the crowded platform. He was placing a ticket inside the warm palm of her glove. He was standing with her in the cold, looking through a grated window at a man making bottles in a roaring furnace. So, does Gabriel's recollection of his life with Greta actually seem like a narrative, like a history of their marriage? Yeah, what is he, what is he stringing together here? Random moments. <laughs> <laughs> but there, there is a link here, right? There is an associative logic. It's all linked together by sense impressions, right? The color of an envelope, the sound of the birds, the feeling of her warm hand as he presses a railway ticket into it, right? These are the kinds of things that he remembers and that he dwells on. Um, you know, there's the point you know, where he's sitting um, up against the window, right? Kind of feeling the cold, the cold sensation on his fingertips, right? So. Gabriel seems to be like like almost addicted to these kinds of sensory moments, right? He is a person that we might say is of high sensibility, right? He is highly susceptible to sense impressions. So here's you know 18th century sensibility coming back around to bite us, right? And I think the major problem with this that the story points out is how this leads Gabriel to think about other people. So if you look on page 432, can I get somebody uh, to read for us 
the paragraph that starts with, he stood still in the gloom of the hall. I can. Thank you, Peyton. He stood still in the gloom of the hall, trying to catch the air that the voice was singing and gazing up at his wife. There was grace and mystery in her attitude, as if she were a symbol of something. He asked himself, what is a woman standing on... Wait, sorry. He asked himself, what is a woman standing on the stairs in the shadow, listening to distant mu music, a symbol of? If he were a painter, he would be paint her in that attitude. Her blue felt hat would show off the bronze of her hair against the darkness, and the dark panels of her skirt would show off the light ones. Distant music. He would call the picture if he were a painter. So what's weird about the way Gabriel is responding to his wife standing on the stairway, looking, listening to listening to that song? It's like a painting. Yeah, he imagines her as art, right? She turns from you know Greta Conroy, living human being with feelings and thoughts and a history, right, into aesthetic objects that he names distant music, right? And there's something a little bit ridiculous in this too, and that like he imagines her as a symbol of something, but he doesn't know what of. Right? What is a woman standing in the stairway listening to music a symbol of? <laughs> <laughs> Why can't she just be standing in the stairway listening to music? Yeah. But yeah, he, he has this need to make everything into a pretty picture or into, or into some kind of unified aesthetic impression, right? So he just kind of isol isolates her in this moment and tries to freeze it in his brain like it's a painting. And he, we, we see that he also tends in his thoughts to recycle certain phrases, right? Like, you know, distant music comes up again later in his conversation. And he uses the word, you know, the phrase, a thought-tormented music a couple of times as well, right? So, yeah, yeah, he has a tendency to recycle his own thoughts, his own ideas. Um, now, I don't want to leave this, we've got about like maybe 10 minutes to go here. I don't want to leave this without talking about his encounter uh, with Miss Ivers. Uh, what did you make of that? What's going on there? This is one of his many uncomfortable encounters with a woman, right? Remember this being no like Naman, right? Women's Christmas, right? The typical gender roles are reversed. And Gabriel spends the entire party at the mercy of women. What's Miss Ivers like? What can we tell about Miss Ivers? He comments on how like she was pretty educated, and then also saying uh -huh. that she like at different points she was like a propagandist. So like she seems to like uh -huh. have opinions on things and be like pretty firm in her stance. Yeah. What did, what does she? What in particular does she seem to have firm opinions on? Like Irish culture and like that yeah. nationalist. Yeah, Ireland. so if we're, if we're using terms we talked about last time, what would we describe her as? Culture nationalist? Yeah, although she's probably also a political nationalist, right? But she's clearly a cultural nationalist, right? She wears the large brooch with the Irish device. At various points she talks, she speaks in or about the Irish language, right? At one point, which we'll mention in a moment, to the point of like near absurdity. Um, and what's her issue with Gabriel? What does she call Gabriel? Yeah, she refers to him as a West Briton. It's if he's like trying to deny his Irish heritage by wanting to deny <laughs> vacation in Ireland. Yeah. Basically. Yeah, now, 
let me explain a little bit about where she wants him to go to, right? So we're going to once again draw our vaguely potato-shaped map. <laughs> um, so the Aran Islands are three little hunks of rock in the North Atlantic, kind of right about there, off the coast of Galway. Um, they are as far west as you can go and still be in Ireland. Now, what do we remember about that first wave of the Irish literary revival and their attitudes towards the west? Glorification of the west. Yeah, the west is supposed to be where the real Ireland is located the real heart of Ireland, despite the fact that like, this is literally like on the fringes of the country. Right? <clears throat> if you step off of the largest island in Ishmore, then you are no longer in Ireland. You're, well, you're, you're in the Atlantic Ocean then. <laughs> <laughs> but I digress. Um, but yeah, so she, she seems to want to be getting in touch with some kind of authentic idea of Irishness, right? Um, the Aran Islands were also um, Irish-speaking, predominantly, at the time. You can also get very good wool sweaters uh, from the Aran Islands, though they are, um, they are now criminally expensive. <laughs> but, um, and what, what does Gabriel say he wants to do instead that sets her off? Go to like France or Belgium and then like oh, to yeah. keep up with those languages. Oh yeah. Oh so I'm gonna go on a cycling tour in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Having to your own language to keep up with, right? Irish. Now when, when Gabriel says, if it comes to that, you know, Irish is not my language, is he wrong? I mean, we're, we're at a party in Dublin, right? Is anybody in that room speaking Irish? No, I don't speak Irish. Yeah, and Miss Ivers only does when she's leaving to make a point, right? So, you know, while part of her function is, seems to be to make, um, to make Gabriel uncomfortable, I think there is also a little bit of a critique in here of the narrow-minded nationalist, right? Um, who adopts a cultural identity largely in opposition to some other cultural identity, right? So if Gabriel has a cultural identity, it's a cosmopolitan one, right? You know, he's somebody who seems to want to be a citizen of everywhere and nowhere, right? You know, they were, he, he and Greta wear galoshes because everyone wears them on the continents. Um, <clears throat> you know, he wants to go for, he wants to go to France and Belgium for a cycling tour. Um, he doesn't want to be drawn into any kind of Irish nationalist discourse. But this also kind of means that he's not really a believer in much of anything except his own senses and his own sense impressions, right? He's kind of unmoored from anything, kind of like deeper outside himself. And I think what, like, this is where we might bring his self-revelation into this, like kind of that, that real moment of epiphany on page 437. Because on the outside, with the end, about his whole cosmopolitan view, not wanting to be only seen as an Irishman and just up on that culture, it's like, uh -huh. okay, on the outside, it's okay, you know, you want to be a well rounded person, that's good, but then on the inside, it's like, <laughs> what, are, what are you like rooted in? Like, what's your connection to anything? Yeah. And I mean, how, how does he respond when, um, Miss Ivers mentions that Greta's from the West. Or when Greta says she'd like to go back. And he's like, well, 
you can go ahead. I'm not going <laughs> yeah, he's kind of a dick about it, right? Yeah, I said, well, you, you can go if you like. <laughs> and then, you know, oh God, when he finds out, oh, that she actually had a history back there, right? That she had a boyfriend. Yeah. That there was something in her life before him. Before she could even tell him that he was dead, she was like, oh, so that's why you wanted to go back. So yeah. Like, Which, and, and I mean, like, you know, like, we're, the, the way the, the timeline here seems to work, I mean, if she would have, you know, left Galway in her teens, right. they're 40. <laughs> 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 right? So, you know, it, it, it's, it's like she, she wants to go back to Galway to hook up with some guy she hasn't seen in 20 years. <laughs> I mean, like, like, the way his mind leaps to that is ridiculous, right? And I think that's the realization he comes to, right? right? Bottom of page 437, right? Gabriel felt humiliated by the failure of his irony and by the evocation of this figure from the dead, a boy in the gas works. While he had been full of memories of their secret life together, full of tenderness and joy and desire, she had been comparing him in her mind with another. A shameful consciousness of his own person assailed him. He saw himself as a ludicrous figure, acting as a penny boy for his aunts, a nervous, well-meaning sentimentalist, orating to vulgarians and idealizing his own clownish lusts, the pitiable, fatuous fellow he had caught a glimpse of in the mirror. Instinctively, he turned his back more to the light lest she might see the shame that burned upon his forehead. So now she sees how immature he's being. <laughs> yeah. And he's so ashamed. He's like, Mom, uh -huh. I've been a whole person the whole day. And even while my wife is crying, I'm still being a whole uh -huh. person because I'm only thinking of myself. Yeah. I mean, even like when, when he's, you know, he rewrites his speech to try to stick it to Miss Ivers, right? right? And then he's actually relieved when she doesn't stick around. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I, I think like you know, there there is here like kind of like a process of maturing that occurs that requires him to actually connect his impressions to real things and real people, and not to idealize his sense impressions. Okay, so does anybody have any questions about this since we are about out of time? Yes. Um, a few lines down for 38. <laughs> when he, uh -huh. when, um, he asked Greta, like, how did Michael die? And he was like, uh -huh. what, he died so young, Greta? Consumption, was it? What did he mean by consumption? Consumption is tuberculosis. Okay. Which also, like, when, um, when Bartle Darcy sings the song, he's a little hoarse mm -hmm. because he's got a cold. So that would also probably recall Michael Fury with his respiratory disorder right. singing the song, you know, as he's dying outside of Greta's window, right? <laughs> so it has that kind of added level of emotional resonance. Um, also, I don't even mention in passing Freddie's mm -hmm. character. Okay. Okay, so why in Certain, like with Mr. Brown, Brown, yes, Mr. Brown. Uh -huh. he, um, he referred to him as Teddy instead of Freddie. Like he kept mentioning him as Teddy. Yeah. Was it like they tried to write him off because he was like drunk the whole time? Yeah, I, I, I think yes. so. Freddie is essentially a kind of um, he's a depiction of a common stereotype of the era known as stage Irish, mm -hmm. um, and. Stage Irish characters were usually it's kind of apish looking, mm -hmm. um, comic characters, usually drunk. And it was, yeah, it was a, a British and sometimes American um, convention in the theater. And I think that's kind of what Freddie is, or what, what's being drawn on there. And Mr. Brown, as the only Anglo Irishman in the room, is kind of like drawn to this person he can basically dominate. I know it's, it mentioned um, that he that it reminded him of what was it? something about blackface. I've never seen that. 
Um, Christy Minstrels. Yes, yeah. Christy Minstrels. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Maybe that's why they tie that to him, and then you saying that kind of. Yeah, then he he mentions yeah the the chief and singing in the pantomime. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I, and, and I think look, there are all kind of like one of the things that James Joyce is always doing in just about anything he writes is demonstrating to you how much more clever he is than you. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, like there are all kinds of things that link together here that we just like don't have time an hour <laughs> to stitch those these various constellations together, right? I mean, like, like there are people who spend their whole careers just like picking apart a single Joyce story. Um, those people are mostly nuts, <laughs> but, but they exist. <laughs> I know some of them. <laughs> <laughs>